Why are you doing this to me? You're a smart kid. I'll figure it out. What's your favorite scary movie? It's one of this. Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Arrow in the Head show. Lance, of course, Mr. Fallon over there. John, this is a special day. It's a long time coming. I'm excited yeah. to get into this, but I also, uh, you know, respect our time. So, my friend, I know it's a, a special day for you. Um, actually, a movie I acted in called um, Gunfight at Rio Bravo is coming out today. So this will be out on Friday. So it'll be out by then. So it's a Western that mixes like old fashioned you know, Western story and everything like that, but with 80s, like, one-man army affinities, if you will. Um, my role is really small. I play uh, Samuel, the drunk coroner. So I basically play myself without being a coroner, uh, who likes to uh, rob money from people. It's a small role, but the movie is always going to hold a special place in my heart because after two years of being in prison in the Canadian mountains... Once, once I escaped, that was the uh, first thing that uh, I did was to go and act in a Western. Uh, so that was a trip just to be in a Western town and, you know, dress like a cowboy. And after two years of being confined, it was a great way to um, to get back to normal life, if you will, quote unquote, because I can't really say today's society is quite normal, but that's another yeah, you got uh, you got to enter the film. You got to hang out in Arizona. Arizona yeah, Arizona. Arizona. You know, Matthias Hughes is in it from I Come in Peace. Of course, it stars and was produced by Alexander Nevsky. Thanks a lot, bro, for bringing me <clears> on <throat> the film. And we already shot the sequel, so I'm in the sequel as well, taken from Rio Bravo, same character. And uh, directed by Joe Cornett, who we've had on uh, before. So thank you, Joe, as well. So, yeah, so I'm excited. I'm going to, you know. Get a tub of popcorn and uh, watch it tonight and see uh, see how it came out. So I'm pumped. Oh, I'm excited to see it as well, man. Uh, try to support Definitely. local guys, man. So I got you. So today we're actually going to talk about a, a movie that uh, changed my life, really, to some degree on a professional level and a personal level. We'll talk about uh, that a bit later on. It's called The Hitcher, 1986, Robert Harmon. And we're going to have the screenwriter, Eric Red, my good friend, Eric Red, uh, down the road. I'll give him a ring and he'll talk about the film uh, with us. But before then, you know, what are you drinking? Um, I wish I had more, something nice, dude. I got to be honest. I just grabbed one of my, uh, my mujeres, White Claws. I put a little vodka in a coffee cup along with this just so I have a little something to kick, but that's it, man. It's one of those days, you know, I, I always joke, but like uh, this week feels like, like the week before payday, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm eating a lot more rice and chicken, yeah. I'm drinking, <laughs> drinking a lot of coffee cups, I got to do the, dish, the dishes, you know, it's just like, it is one of those weeks, but it'll work and it'll give me something to toast to you and our audience with John. I know you're not drinking beer. What are you drinking, buddy? Do we even? <laughs> We're not gonna have to bother for a while to ask me what I'm drinking. It's the same thing over and over again because of uh, current stomach issues. Is gin and tonic. Um. Yeah. <laughs> Could be worse. I guess. Yeah. Well, on that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, cheers to you, my friend. Cheers to uh, all of you. Everybody. Thank you for popping up, popping in. Yeah. Cheers. Hello, my friend! Hey! It's, this is one of the few movies um, that, I mean, not, not there's a good handful that I think I could directly tie to the Arrow on the Head site. Mm. Um, and I um, I didn't grow up as a kid watching The Hitcher. It's just one of those movies that I just never picked up. Um, but I remember in high school, um, the arrow, which I believe to be you, unless uh, you yes, had some guy. I, I, know, I know I'm giving you a hard time. You know, there's some guy you're just sitting there smoking cigars. Some guys writing all the. Reading. You're just like no. do better. <laughs> no, I know, of course. You wrote, uh, you know, a review on the Hitcher, and and you said a lot of stuff in that. It was like very important. I remember you guys were really good about 
I don't want to say promoting because obviously it was many years after it came out, but I felt like you were the first to truly like kind of push it, especially like on the, the DVD side, because I bet that's around the time the DVD was around because um, that's the first time I saw it. And uh, I always kind of relate this movie to the Aaron Head. Well, for me, I first saw it when it came out on home video and I saw it on beta. So I always remember it was a beta tape. That's uh, yeah. The film really... Um really marked me it's a movie i kept watching over and over again over and over again uh to the point i just thought st structurally it was genius so at some point i was in a uh i don't i don't remember if it was a comic book shop or if it was a horror convention pretty sure it was maybe a comic book shop but i'm old so uh and i found a draft of the script for sale somebody had like a bootleg draft of the script for sale it wasn't the final draft is i think it was maybe the second or third draft kind of cool so you have like a history yeah so i took that and as i got older and wanted to get into film i studied that script in terms of its structure and the way it was written the way it used action to move its story forward um the vagueness in terms of the villain but anyways long story short so i learned how to write screenplays even before i went to film school from the hitcher script and uh, Sid Field's book about writing screenplay. So then when I started Air on the Head and it became successful in 2001, so one year after I started the site, I reached out to the writer, Eric Red, because he's the guy that inspired me to start writing sc screenplays. And I wound up interviewing him for three hours on the phone and we hit it off. So then jump forward a bit, maybe a year or so, I went to L.A. and we met up in person and we hit it off. So after that became kind of like a, a friendship, a really deep friendship. I was the best man at his wedding, for example, and also a partnership in terms of working together, written scripts together. We've worked, tried to get film projects off the ground together. Uh, we did 100 Feet his movie 100 Feet, which I was in together. So it's just funny how it, it went from a movie to a script, which launched me launched me into my own screenwriting career, to then a friendship. So basically, the movie kind of changed my life to some degree. So yeah, but the film itself, I'll let you start, man. Uh... Gorgeous movie. Um... Yeah, John uh, well, I'll, yeah I'll, I'll touch on the, the the writing of course but just in terms of the visual medium that's that's i'll be honest i always say this about um movies it's you know i love a good script but you get a movie with very little in it and it, it could be beautiful you know that's, that's why movies are, are you know are special hence why lyrics might be important to a song but they're never going to be as important as the melody and the tune because that's the yeah. point of the music and i i had forgotten how gorgeous this movie is and you know Robert Harmon has a great eye. His cinematographer, uh, John Seal, right? Am I saying yeah, that correctly? John Seal. Which it's been a while since I looked into him. And let me just fucking pull this up real quick, man. I um obviously did the Hitcher right. Let me see. Uh, Witness Coast. Witness. He must. He obviously loves um Mr. Harrison Ford, of course. He did the Firm. He did Ghost of Mississippi. Talented I mean, the, uh, Mr. Ripley. Mr. Ripley. Yeah. I mean, dude. Uh, let's just say that right now. I mean, that that's a pretty impressive uh, body work. And, you know, we haven't got to uh, Mad Max Fury Road. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That alone. And they, I think, nailed the setting really well. And I think that has a lot to do with why this works. The spatial awareness, these, like, wide scope shots, you know, like, you, you could feel the loneliness. Like, you are alone. And I'm, yeah. I, I'm a paranoid guy, so I'm always thinking, like, what if this was me? What would I do? I'd be screwed. You know, and especially because there's no cell phones in this time. So you are, um, you know, on your own. The sort of cat mouse open road thriller type of, I mean, it's horror, but a thriller, I would say like a, the elevated horror of the 80s and 90s of, of what I always call it in terms of like how you would uh, describe it. I would say that this movie directly influenced every early to mid 90s thriller in terms of like how it was shot, how it's structured, the crazy man, you know, the, the innocent guy, it's kind of getting a little swept up in it and he's just kind of yeah. like slowly picking at him. I mean, I, you know, I love Kurt Russell um, and I always thought Breakdown was a really good movie, but holy shit, that Breakdown basically owe everything to this exact movie. I mean, I always want to be like, guys, like Eric Redding's going to get a, a little bit of a check for Breakdown <laughs> too, you know? It's, the it's, same it's, thing it's... for Joyride. 
Yeah, yeah. Joe, yeah, Joe Riggs probably even even closer. I but you know, yeah. that's a little later. But yeah, yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. Uh lightning in a bottle. Uh, in, in the sense that every element came together to to create something that's that. fairly unique. So, you know, from the script to Harmon's uh, directing to uh, the performance by Rutger Hauer uh, and, you know, Jennifer Jason Lee, of course, C. Thomas Howell. I have some some comments about him later on. I was kind of like on and off with him. Uh, and even the guy that played the sheriff or the... The, the, he was just fantastic. What was his name? Um, Wait, the, the first one or the one later in the movie? Uh, Jeffrey DeMunn, captain, yeah. the, the captain. Yeah, yeah I, captain I thought DeMond, he was yeah. incredibly affable uh, and realistic. Yeah. We talk about him, the blob. It's like the same character. Yeah. Basically, true, that guy, yeah. that guy yeah. moved to a small town after this and, and loved the waitress, you know? Yeah. So, yeah, you know, they tried to recapture it uh, with the 2007 shit-ass remake that really obviously did not understand which was Platinum Dune, by the way, did not understand what made the original work. Uh, they tried to recapture it or cash in on it, really, with the uh, sequel, the horrible sequel called The Hitcher 2. Uh, and they brought back Hell. Yeah, yeah, he gets whacked in, in the opening, and then it's Jake Busey for some reason, and who plays either the same character or a different character, but let's not waste time on those, uh, because it's a waste of fucking time. So... The thing about the hitcher is, at the end of the day, it's a very simple premise. I mean, you know, it's a kid, picks up a hitchhiker, winds up being a serial killer, dumps him, and then he keeps coming back, winds up being framed for his murders, and there you have it. All the best love and kisses. But it's, for me, it's the execution. First of all, of course, like we mentioned before, like the directing, just an example, a, a brilliant uh, shot for me anyways. When the hitcher gets thrown out of the car he's on the ground and the camera's on the ground so you see like you know the lines of a road and it pushes in as he rises and then turns into a low ag and low angle medium shot of him fucking beautiful fucking beautiful and there's a bunch of little moments like that in the movie or for example when um in the last act when uh, john Ryder, rutger howard's character gets you know flings open the prison bus thing and again, it's a low angle shot on him before he jumps on the car with the shotgun in his hand. And he goes, ah, and they put like a, a lion roar sound. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And of course, it's in slow motion. Uh, I think there's a lot of class in the way the film was directed and, and shot. A lot of beautiful wide shots. Uh, the music by Mark Isham is is almost like it's it's like sur surreal, eth ethereal. What's the big fucking fancy uh, pants oh, word? Uh, uh, ethereal yeah that's it that's a big fancy pants of words i'm looking for uh <laughs> it's it's not like your usual like horror thriller kind of thing it's very kind of like moody and 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 reflective in, in a weird way yes i uh, like that i like that yes and then you know the john Ryder character whose motivations are not clear uh which is left open to uh audience interpretation a lot of people didn't like that and i know roger ebert didn't like that um and he, he thought because the um the killer had no motive it made what he does even more appalling i guess uh but i i disagree with that i i think it makes you think it makes you try to kind of like figure and I, I got my own theories it's almost like an art film element hardcore thriller or thriller uh, art film element where you know it could mean a lot of things john Ryder can symbolize a lot of things uh for example at some point, I was rewatching the movie, and Jim uh, Halsey, he, you know, about like in the first act. Oh, so he's like discouraged, and he's on his knees in the sand, and he takes the gun and and goes like this, but then he doesn't do it. And right away, I'm like, maybe this is an entire metaphor for life, how life beats the shit out of you to the point where you want to give up, then you don't, and you forge forward, and look at jim's character arc you know he's a goofy kid at the beginning of the movie but through everything john Ryder puts him through at the end of the movie he's a man you know you, you sense that he changes he toughens up he's not as naive for me you know john Ryder could just be life he's just life life is happens it fucks you over it sucker punches you life's not fair and but you got to soldier through it 
And at the end of it, you come out of it, you know, a stronger, wiser, better rounded and more cynical person like I've become. So that's one thing you can think of. I'm surprised though that, that Ebert, but that does make sense even from like a, a critic's perspective. It's like he basically is saying without the motivation, it's more deranged, but wouldn't that be the point? Like you want this guy to be, you want to fear him. You want, he, he's the devil. He's wherever you're at, he's popping up. You know, you can't hide, you can't run. He'll always, he'll always get you. I thought that, that that's what I like so much is that you had no idea. And he didn't seem too worried about getting caught either. You know? Oh no, he's not worried about what's his line. I love this line. I actually wrote it down on, uh, on my social, something along the lines where, you know, uh, Jim tells uh, John Ryder, you know, they're, they're going to catch you. And he answers. Yeah, sure. So what? <laughs> he doesn't give a fuck. He doesn't give a fuck. You know, um, what about the uh, famous Mack truck scene? Infamous, infamous. So it's Mack funny. Truck. I um I didn't know it. It was an infamous scene. Uh, I all I remember is that when the remake came out, they gender swapped it. I remember that. Yeah, and they showed uh, it. They showed it. Yes, well, which is funny because I actually if one thing I forgot is I forgot they didn't show it. So mm. I was kind of surprised. I was like, oh, interesting. Um, but you know, I, I like you said, this is kind of a classy movie. And it's not really about that. So I actually found it fine. I mean, it's it's sad that they kill off Jason, uh, Jennifer Jason Lee's character because she was building up, you know, to, to leave the guy and, you know, they had this relationship. But I thought that was a cool, cool moment because it was basically set up in a dark cab with just the red tail lights being the only light in the, the thing. And you just have him yeah. basically tell him, like, kill me, please kill me. Like, do it. Yeah. Have some balls. Do it. Yeah. And I was there like, you I go. like that. Have some you know? balls. So that kind of goes into the whole my theory that you know it could be life a metaphor for life but also a metaphor for becoming a man because john Ryder, when he's in the truck and he says take the gun put the gun to me and i'll blow my brains out and the kid can't do it because he's got no balls so he doesn't do it so Ryder, you know rips the girl in half and he looks like i even wrote it down he looks upset when he's sitting in that truck and doing the revving and then, you know, uh, Jim walks in and he's very disappointed in him when he doesn't blow his brains out. So, the, yeah. you know, obviously the guy wants to die, but I think it has more to do with he wants to teach this kid a really fucked up lesson. Yeah, I can see that. You know? he, he's obviously uh, there's many times he could just kill them, but I was looking as like, yeah, he lets him go. You know, he he, <laughs> he he plays with his food. But the families in the the first issue of Kyrie, he killed right. Remember that? They, he's like, oh, is, did you know that guy? He goes, I picked him up before. He go, and he, yeah. he, I forget the exact line. He goes, well, he doesn't have any arms or legs. Yeah. <laughs> he's yeah. just letting him know. <laughs> so, you know, uh, the poor kid could have been dead 20 minutes in, but he, he lets him live. He lets but him live. He lets this. him live because, as opposed to the, his other victims, this kid fought back. This kid yeah, yeah, him pushes out. him out of the thing, and that's it. So it's almost like the hitcher, John Ryder, kind of like, Hey, you know what? I like this guy. Yeah. Look oh, at yeah. look at uh, he, he, there's potential here. So let me put him through hell so he could become a big boy at the end of the movie. Yeah. Uh, or or you know, the other angle is obviously John Ryder has a death wish. He wants to die, he doesn't give a fuck if he lives, but he wants that kid to kill him. Why does he want that kid to kill him? Yeah, that's the interpretation. Because by killing him, then that kid will grow. I know, man. We're 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 going to uh, two balls be, deep, man. Or or I could well, no, that's the point of analyzing movies. Or it could be that he wants to, you know, make that kid do the one thing he could never do, which is kill. You know, it could also be like something messed up where, you know, you push him so far, like he'll kill, but he'll never forget it. Like his his life has changed because you're you're right though. He goes after him, he chases him, he messes with him. But that's why the movie's so good though. He even saves him. You know, when the cops yeah. are after him and he yeah. shoots the chopper. You know. It's just, that's a cool save too. Yeah. He shoots the chop. I mean, it's it, it's good action, you know. Oh, yeah. Of course, the, the the guy did Nowhere to Run, uh, the JCVD movie I, I enjoy. So there's an action director as well, but it's it's sprinkled in, like you said, it moves the plot forward and it, it never feels action for the sake of action, which I am not against. I love action for the sake of action, but in this movie, it's it's clever, it's witty, it, it, it it's, you know, it's well-balanced. So every time it happens... You know, it's just uh, to, to move things along and the kid just keeps getting deeper and deeper. Every time something happens, that kid is just deeper in the mud of shit, you know? I mean, I I, uh, I watched it with me. She never saw it and she was 
Body or Nail. She's like, that was the most like intense movie I've seen. I was like, nice. right, right, nice. nice. Um, real quick, can I talk about the 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 diner scene? Yeah, I, I think it gets brought up a lot, and it absolutely should. That to me would be the scene that that I would uh, I would tell people about when he sits down and um uh, what's his name uh howl's all dirty and sweaty and just his you know, fucking hair is like this shaking. yeah yeah and how uh rucker sits down sweaty as well these these uh, intense eyes i love this man's staring this yeah. and it's just this conversation but it's not a conversation it's just very very minimal dialogue yeah. and the kid, he goes you know why are you doing this and he like licks the fucking yeah. pennies and puts away and he gets real close and he's like you're smart, kid. Go figure it out. Why are you doing this to me? You're a smart kid. Go figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's it. That's all. <laughs> it's just how that was shot. And, and Rucker Howard doing tons of lifting with very little dialogue. I mean, that, that's why he's an actor and I'm sitting here praising him because that, I was like, man, that's what I would show to people. Like, you want to know how to act when you have little dialogue? Look at every movement he does. His eye yeah. flicker. I mean, it, it's, dude. I'm sorry. I just had to get that out. I mean, that's like the scene I've been thinking about since I watched it. But um, you know what? You know what's funny? Initially, I spoke to Eric about this. Uh, Sam Elliott was going to be cast to play that. that. And uh, although I, I saw on, on Internet Move Database, they say something like it didn't happen because of scheduling issues or whatever. Yeah. That's not the case. It didn't happen because Sam Elliott didn't want to play a bad guy at the end of the day. And if you look at his career, he never plays a bad guy. Great actor. I don't think. I don't think it would have worked. I mean, maybe it would have, but not as. It would have as... been. It would have been a, a bit. I think like what happened with Sean Bean playing the Hitcher in the remake. Very, you know, straightforward villain. What uh, Rudger brings to the thing again is that what's that ethereal? What, what's the? No, fuck? It, 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 he's he is very ethereal. There's uh, there's yeah. a. It's like yeah. you know, there's a charisma. There's a you know, he has like you know, a very soft face, very piercing blue eyes. A very movement he's not like a thug or i'm a killer you know he's there's just something off he uh, comes off insane like legit insane yeah. not movie bad guy insane but like yeah you know and soft there's a softness about him i know that sounds weird but there's a softness about his look the way he moves and everything and then take that softness and contrast it with what he does I think just really, really makes the character pop. So personally, I know they, you know, they they remade the Hitcher, and I'm pretty sure they'll try to remake it again down the road because that's what you know Hollywood does, and it won't work again because there's no fucking way you're gonna get an actor like Rudger Hauer that's able to bring what he brought to the role. I mean, I think that's his most iconic role, you know, with Blade Runner being second, and of course, Wanted Dead or Alive or split second but the hitcher i think is his crowning uh, jewel performance wise and I, I can't take my fucking eyes off the dude yeah i mean blade oh. runner it, it's iconic absolutely but you know I, I would argue this is more nuanced of a performance and i think he had a lot more to do hence why i i agree with you it's far more iconic um yeah i mean if they would ever remake this it would have to be so incredibly different that it would be like hitch your name only so what's the point just make a new movie. I mean, we'll be a girl. Let's make the hitcher a girl. Yeah, it's no, it's not gonna work. It's not gonna. I mean, everything about this, like you said, was right place, right time. I completely agree. I mean, they can't even be re remade now because cell phones would have eliminated half the movie. Yeah. You know, it, it that's that's the scary part about the 80s and even the 90s. It's like you got a flat on a and an empty road, looks like you're walking 80 miles. I mean, you know, like you're alone. So, no, this belongs in the time period it's shot, it, it's perfect for it is. And you know, it's it's one of those movies that it's just it's it's just a, a ticking time clock, you know. And, and that, it's not necessarily real time, but it almost feels like it's almost just like twenty four hours, maybe maybe a little longer. But it's this fucking kid just in. This is the, the worst day of his life, you know. And it, it works. It works. Uh, the transfer is beautiful. They're coming out of the four K, which um, I heard. Yeah. You know, we'll, we'll ask. Uh, I'm going to ask Eric about because I think that's this is one of those movies that is going to be gorgeous. You know, the version I saw, the Blu-ray is amazing. I can't imagine the cleanup job. And that's been a long time coming. You know, people have been asking yeah, about this movie. So, but I mean, okay, then, real quick, then what Then what didn't you like? Because I know you were saying earlier about uh, C. Thomas Howell, and you were saying you'll get back that, to That's him. pretty much for me. I mean, he does fine, you know, uh, but there's some shots, his reactions. Uh, he looks, uh, how can I say this? Uh, like an idiot. <laughs> Uh, there, there, are, there are times the way he reacts, his facial expression, he, he looks like an idiot. Poofy hair. 
He's like, eh, yeah. I just get a lot of yeah out of him. Does that make sense? Yeah. No? I, I guess. I guess. I, I, fair enough. I mean, he'll always be uh, he'll always be soul man to me. So. Soul man. He didn't give up. He got down. Got out. That's the you know that's the <laughs> soul. <man. laughs> I know, right? Nice, nice. Touche. That's it. So, but you know he's fine. But now and then he comes off like like a mook. And the one thing that always bothered me and it's really a nitpick so you know you know a movie's great when all i got is nitpicks is remember when the two police cars and jim is outrunning them and somebody blows a tire so one car flips a police car but then the other one flips now this one flipped because the tire got shot and i get it but why the other one flipped that always bothered me good eye man i didn't even pick up on that great stunt though i mean that's another thing we we did not address uh the are amazing. in our convo the, the stunt work and the action uh is fucking incredible you know when he blows up the gas station comes out of the the the, the bay door and just blah, blows yeah. up yeah 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 it's just yeah it goes through the door actually that's the gas station scene now i'm going in tangent sorry guys dolls the way that was shot that was fucking beautiful so he you know the, the oil is going everywhere and the hitcher is in the truck and then he takes out a match you know and then the camera is tracking with C. Thomas Howell's feet running shoon, 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 in slow motion. Then it cut back to him with the match. And then, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, so he's like crawling. Yeah. Wow. 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 And even, yeah, dude, I, I, I could blow loads all over this movie all day, man. Everything's on point. Uh, music, uh, stunt work, I agree, camera man. work, performances, pacing. That's it. Uh, I, I got nothing. Honestly. What about yeah. you? Is there anything you didn't like or? I mean, Jennifer Jason Lee's southern accent was a bit, um, a bit hammy. Of course, you would pick up on that. Of course. Yeah. Well, because it's like, dude, you got to keep... Accents are hard, and I don't know why everybody thinks they can do them. Just... Best to the house. You could be southern and not have an accent. I, I hear it every day, you know? I have half the people that, that live in my town, and I'm south, uh, have a Jersey accent. So it's like people... I don't know. So my whole thing is just like, if you're going to do an accent, man, it's like, you got to get it, because if not, I'm going to be like, you know, your A was, ah, over there. But now it's just like, you got to get in the car because y'all got to get over here. It's like, oh, no, no, no. You said car or y'all. Like, ah. But whatever. She did great. Um, no, I, I actually, I think I like this movie more. Uh, not that I never disliked it, but I, I was blown away, man. I think maybe it, this kind of slow burn thriller thing. It's just I'm at that right age where like I, I this it's it's awesome, man. I got nothing. Rucker Hauer is a legend. And this is a performance that I, I'm glad he's getting recognized for, man. Um, I no, man. I um I absolutely love it. It's one I um I've been waiting to revisit. It's been a while since I've watched it, maybe you know, five years, maybe longer. And if this is kind of uh you know response I want when I watch something, I'm just like, oh man, I forgot how amazing this is. So no, dude, I'm glad that we got to do this. I really am because yeah, you know, I was gonna wait till uh, the 4K came out, but now that we did this, it's like I'm more excited to get that. So before I give uh, Mr. Red a call and bring him on, I'm gonna ask you. A couple of quick fire questions and just answer the first thing that comes to your head. <laughs> <I'll> do, okay. <laughs> All right. You ready? All right. Why the pennies on the eyes? Um, isn't that have something to do with the Day of the Dead, the uh, the Mexican tradition of um, something? I think it's something along the lines of that. That's what I took out of it. I don't have the specifics in, my, in front of me, but I know I've seen that in other movies where that was a culture. Yeah. So I, I think it's that. It's to... Um... They put it on. They put it on corpses usually. Yeah, put it on corpses so they could pay the the ferryman who brings you from the land of the living to the dead. That you got to pay the guy for some reason. It doesn't work for free. I don't know. All right, next question. Why does John Ryder play with the spit with his hands after being spat in the face by by Jim? I guess uh, if I had to guess, that he he finds that guy sticking up for himself cute and maybe even sort of uh, admirable. You know, I'm like oh, he actually did it. Oh, fair enough. <laughs> okay, well, okay, I'll go with that. Let me let me get a third one. How did John Ryder get the finger in the French fries? I don't think there's a, a, a logical explanation how he did without her knowing it. Um, so that might, to me, that would lean more towards the he might not actually be alive theory of like, you know, him being a, a the devil or a demon or an evil spirit. Cause mm. that, that didn't make it. Make, I mean, it was cool in the movie, but yeah, I was like, wait, she's Owen in there. 
you know, she would have, she put the burger together. So he had to slip it in after she put it together. So I don't think it logically makes sense, but hey, maybe Eric has a, 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 a scene that I didn't see in the script or, or he thought of something. So I'd have to I'd probably go back and ask him. All right. Well, you know what? Let's, uh, let's, uh, let me give him a call. Tell him to come on and, uh, it's uh, let's grill the creator of the Hitcher about the Hitcher. Hey, Eric Red in the house. How you doing, buddy? Hi, everybody. How are you? Lance and I just rewatched the Hitcher, and I gotta say, uh, it definitely holds up like a champ still to this day. So uh, we figured we'd annoy you and uh, grill you a little bit about the movie, if you don't mind. Yeah, you bet. Whatever you, whatever you guys. Would like to hear about it. Yeah. <laughs> oh God! Okay, you open the, you open up the floodgates then. Absolutely. Uh, I, I want to give just a bit of background. How old were you when you when you sold the script? You were in your twenties or something, right? Yeah, I, I was about 25, 24 or twenty five when I uh, when I sold the screenplay. I was I wrote it when I was twenty three, uh, and I'd, I'd moved from New York to Texas. i uh, and I moved to Austin. I'd, I'd grown up in Manhattan and I, I kind of wanted the change of scene. And uh, when I got on the road, I drove, I did an auto drive away, just like the character Jim Halsey does. That's how I got the idea for that. Uh, and back in the day, I, I don't know whether they still have this, you know, you could, there were services that you could um, deliver a car from point A to point B anywhere around the country. Like if you needed to go to Texas, as I did, they would have a car that would need to go to Texas. And so you didn't pay for the rental. You just paid for the gas and you delivered it. So I did that. But, um, you know, growing up in the East Coast, uh, I'd never seen the wide open spaces really before. Uh, and Texas, Oklahoma, you know, places I drove through when I was going. And it made a it made an indelible impression. Uh, just the sheer weight of the sky and the landscape. And it was it was un it was unnerving, actually, for, uh, you know, for an East Coast kid like me, a city kid. Um, so that definitely, plus having a lot of time on my hands while I was doing the drive kind of informed the, the story. And I'd been, I'd been thinking for a while about, I, I've, I'd always thought that the Doors song Riders in the Storm would make a great movie. I knew it would at least make a great opening for a movie. You know, I mean, you could literally begin with somebody driving and a hitchhiker in the road in the rain and the lightning and picking them up and they're a killer on the road. Uh, so I, I started with that. And uh, the story just kind of fell into place during that long drive. And a lot of it had to do was I, I sort of said, like, with each progressive scene, what wouldn't I expect? What's the last thing I would expect to happen next? Mm -hmm. that, that was kind of the creative engine, if you would, if you will, of, of the script. So by the time I got to Texas, I actually rented an apartment, sat down and like banged out, banged it out in like a month. And, um, from then, um, uh, you know, I was, uh, I was living in Texas, uh, at the time and I'd, I'd really never spent any significant time in Los Angeles. I didn't have an agent. I didn't know anybody. I didn't know any companies there. So, you know, I was sort of faced with the problem, you know, okay, I've written this script and how the hell do I sell it? And I, I, what I did know was that the, uh, that there was a general rule in Hollywood. Remember this is back in the eighties. It's a different landscape now, but you know, you had all these different companies with all these different development executives. Um, and uh, I knew that they generally didn't accept scripts that were not submitted by an agent. And, you know, I didn't, didn't have one of those. So I, uh, I, I wrote a teaser letter uh, that basically dared people to read the script. I think I said some bullshit, like, you know, when you, you read the script, you won't sleep for a week. When the movie gets made, the country won't sleep for a month. You know, <laughs> I, I, I nice. did a, and I gave the, I did what I guess we would call a log line now. You know, I gave him about a paragraph, a short paragraph description and the characters and uh, had stationery printed up and was very formal about it. And I got a copy of the California production manual in Texas. And that listed all the film production companies. Um, and so I sent out the letter. I sent about maybe 400 letters and I got about a 40% response, I think, that actually asked to see the script. But the story of how it actually got to Ed Feldman is very Hollywood. Uh, th this happens a lot, as anybody who's in the business knows. You know, um, It's a very convoluted industry and the path from you know, script to film is often very circuitous. But um, 
one of the producers I'd sent it to was uh, a guy named Phil Feldman. Um, and I knew him, you know, I knew movies. I knew he produced the wild bunch. And, you know, I said to myself, 23, 24 year old kid, ah, guy that produced the wild bunch. He's going to love, he's going to love that. So I sent it to Feldman and there was another Feldman at Fox named Ed Feldman, who was another producer over there who, um, who had a company and Fox mailroom delivered it to the wrong Feldman, delivered, yeah. delivered it to Ed Feldman. And his development guy was a, a fellow named David Bombeck, who's a super smart uh, development executive with great taste. And he, um, he actually emailed me back. Uh, he sent me a letter back. We didn't have email in those days. You know, I got a letter one day and he said, you know, normally we don't accept unsolicited material, but you piqued my interest in the script. And I did. And, uh, he immediately liked it. And, and we started having story conversations and I was, uh, in Texas and broke at the time I was driving a taxi. Uh, so I didn't have a phone. So like his running joke was, <laughs> Of the first story conversations, story discussions we had in the movie was punctuated by the sound of a quarters being put into a payphone, you know, <laughs> a Texaco bus stop, a Texaco gas station. So that was sort of how it began. I moved to LA a couple months later, went to the American Film Institute and sold the script when I was there. Uh, John told me a story uh, earlier about how he has a version of the script. So uh, how many versions or how many drafts did you go through before they picked it up? Was that like, did you have a, a bunch of material that you kind of like polished or did you get the one script to them and then you polished it with them before it came to screen? I worked with um, David and, and the other producer, um, um, Kip Oman, at the time. I mean, the biggest change, the, the the whole beginning, the whole first act of the script is pretty much, as I remember, very, very close to what was in the original script. Um, <clears throat> the middle was a little longer, and I tightened up some of that. Um, the biggest change was the third act, which um, I redid, and I redid it. I, I came up with a new, an alternate third act that involved the prison bus and um you know the kids stealing the gun from the the texas ranger commander and going and uh the final showdown so that was something that was done after the script was sold well now i'm curious what was the original last act um it the same chain of events happened in mm -hmm. that the, the kid arranged you know uh the kid went after uh, John Ryder after uh, Nash gets killed, but it was in an urban setting. Okay. Which is part of the problem because, you know, this was the action proper of this movie was, you know, a road movie, uh, you know, set in the deserts. And um, I definitely used, and which certainly still in the film right now, um, this idea of the claustrophobia of the wide open spaces. Cause I remember when I first encountered them driving through, it was, was very oppressive and uh, continued with that theme and through near dark, you know, the, the yeah. idea that the mornings dusts are very, very uh, spectacular. Uh, but I love the idea that you can see forever and there's nowhere to run, nowhere to hide. I mean, the, the juxtaposition of that okay. was great. And, you know, I think that's sort of intrinsic anyway to most road movies. Actually, I just, I just have to add that because I felt that feeling once in my life to my memory and is when when I drove to your wedding. Oh yeah, you you covered. Uh, yeah. uh, John was my the best man at my wedding for oh, yeah. awesome. Out there. Um, and John drove from Canada to Wyoming, so yeah, you went through some of those uh, some very uh, wide open country and and parts of Wyoming, uh, like uh, eastern Wyoming, are are very much like that. Yeah, no, it was very scary. I was like, you know, if my car breaks down, I'm fucked. Like there's yeah. nothing out there, nothing there, nothing there. It's just big, wide open spaces, but nothing. And the yeah, no, it was a bit unnerving. I remember that. Um, I and mean, I think that's essential to a good road thriller. You know, the idea that there's this real economy of elements. You know, there's the random gas station, a diner, and you alone in a car, and maybe another car after you, or somebody after you. Um, it's it's a marvelously spare format, and I think it's been done. Uh, done very well uh, many times and the hitcher is one of those then i i do have to ask because you know before lance and i have been having a discussion about john Ryder, who is john Ryder? what is john Ryder? is he supernatural is he not is he symbolism i, I compared him to life john Ryder is life beats the <laughs> shit out of you keeps coming <laughs> But then you man up, and at the end of the movie, after you blow life away, you're you're, you're a man, yeah. So, 
for you as the writer. So basically John Ryder's daddy. Mm -hmm. who, who is he to you? Do, did you have a, an, a clear idea of a backstory? Is he supernatural? Is he grounded? Is he a metaphor? Who was he to you? Um, yes, I most certainly had a backstory and a psychological backstory. No, to me, he is not supernatural. Okay. Uh, he's a real guy and everything he does in the movie um for instance um being able to appear and find the kid you know and 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 appear in a way that seems like uh, he's a specter or a spirit yeah. you know he's stolen a, a cop police radio he's following the radio calls he knows how to get there i mean there's a procedural reality if in the story if you if you look into it but you know it's a funny thing i used to tell people um and i most certainly did and we all did you know, had a, had a psych had a, the, a very, very clear psychology for why the hitcher is uh, John Ryder's doing this to Jim Halsey. Mm. Um, but, you know, I used to tell people what it was, but in recent years, I've, I've been struck by the fact that everybody has their own perception of it. They come to the movie and they have, because we don't explain it. Not, not, not really. No. Um, the, uh, we hint at it but we, we don't really explain it. I've come to love the fact that everybody has different perceptions of what their relationship is. And I mean, it runs the gamut from supernatural to every form of psychology you can imagine. And I've actually thought that's part of the real strength of the movie. So I don't tell people what I was thinking anymore. I let you, you let, it's like a, it's like a Rorschach blot or, you know, a painting, you know, people bring their own personal, um, you know, based on their background, based on their psychology, they bring their own uh, take on what's going on between these characters. So, yeah, I, 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 I sort of keep it to myself these days. I like, I like that people have their own, uh, their own ideas. More power to them. I actually think this anecdote is pertinent to this conversation and to John and Mai's relationship. About maybe I have never seen The Hitcher too. I never will see the Hitcher. <laughs> why, why would you? Why would you? I, I haven't seen either, and I know about it. I'm okay. Oh uh, yeah, that's funny. The war I continues. Could, I could care less about the Hitcher too. But yeah. years ago, and we're talking ten, maybe fifteen years now, John brought me a copy of of the Hitcher too, and he has. John is convinced that one day he's going to get me to watch this movie, and I've told him straight out, it's never going to happen. <laughs> you would not believe. The tricks and the schemes, John. So th this will continue for the next twenty or thirty <laughs> years. I'm sure. So, so you're gonna go to your grave without without watching this movie. Like that's yes, that's your okay, dude. I've I've swapped the DVDs. You know, like I'm at Eric's house. Oh, let's watch <laughs> the Wild Bunch. You know, so yeah, sure. So I put the Hitcher two DVD in it. Just, let's see. You know, he's like, oh, hey, man. what the hell is this? <laughs> can Can we agree that? Because, you know, I know that Sam Elliott was considered to, to play a, a John Ryder at a certain point. He was, Sam was cast. Oh, yeah. Sam was cast and backed out. He delivered a, an utterly terrifying audition, <laughs> and um, he, he, which I, I, I was thrilled when he was, he was cast. He's one of my favorite actors, and I thought he would have been brilliantly frightening in the role. I unfortunately never got a chance to see that, uh, see that audition. Um, but, yeah, no, he was cast. He had – he – Basically, I think he got cold feet. I think the character was just too scary. Uh, and, yeah. you know, Rutger, when we cast him, embraced all that. You know, I mean, Rutger has no problems with playing bad guys. And Well, that, that was my question. I don't think the film would be the same or the ambiguity in terms of the John Ryder and um, C. Thomas Howell, uh, Halsey, 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 whatever, uh, would be the same if Sam Elliott would have been cast because... Uh, Rudger Hauer, from my perspective, brings a very what was that fancy word I keep forgetting? Ethereal. Well, ethereal. ethereal. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. He he feels like almost otherworldly. Uh, where Sam Elliott is very man's man, rough and tumble. You know, I think it would have been more. Actually, he would be great as White Knuckle, <laughs> to, to be honest. Right. Yeah, which is in a, a book that Eric read, also a screenplay, trying to get off the ground right now, but. I think Rutger Hauer's casting really elevated uh, that the, the vagueness of the uh, of the character and the, the it just it's just weird. He's just a weird motherfucker, man. <laughs> you know. I, I, th I think John, you made actually a, a really really perceptive uh, observation there regarding casting because had we cast Sam, 
um, the movie would have been more grounded. Sam's yeah. very realistic actor. Uh, it would have been more of a procedural and it would have worked great. But Rutger has one of my favorite things out of any of the reviews that came out in, in Newsweek. There, there was a reviewer named Jack Kroll who said that Rutger had the depraved glamour of a fallen angel. Yeah. And I, I, I love that because it's true. Rutger brings a it was just what he had viscerally as a star. You know, he had this ephemeral if you want, but visceral at the same time and obviously very powerful. Uh, but there was, there was the, there was something almost supernatural about him, you know, and, and, in, in just his performance style and uh, he could act with looks and glances extensively, which was very important because the hitcher was a script that had very, very tearsed dialogue. It was always going to be done and the, you know, in, in expressions and glances and, and looks and stuff like that. And yeah, no, I think it would have been a very, I, I think that some of the qualities that people like, and that you mentioned in the film would not have been present had Rutger not been there. I mean, he made an indelible contribution to the movie. Well, I was going to say the, uh, the most humorous part I think it's directly tied to to Rucker's performance, which is when they get they stop at that little um it's not a check, but it's like a road work thing. <clears throat> and the guy comes up and he's like, Where are you from? He's like Chicago's like, God, my wife's from Rockford. And he's like, you know, he has his the knife by his crotch. And like that that's such a serious scene, but like he has that sort of like playful eyes. And he kind of you know, he, he looked kind of joyful. And the guy goes, ah. What does he said? He said, I, I wrote it down. It's like the best part. He goes, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay, sweethearts. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> And it's like that's that's why Rucker is the best because that scene was terrifying and also uh, you know I chuckled so I think that that's a, a skill of an actor and obviously a writer. Well, Rucker was a, was a very funny man in person. He had a, a tremendous sense of humor, and he liked people who were humorous. You know, so yeah, the humor was a very big part of his whole kind of identity. Um, you know, he did all his own stunts. Or he did a lot of his own stunts. A lot of the driving stunts. A big tough guy. I but very, it. very, very funny and 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 very unique individual. Hang on. How, how did you feel when you read that? Because I I read it before we recorded the rest of the episode. Uh, Ebert's review of the film at the time. I lost any and all respect for uh, Roger Ebert after reading that. He, he took a, a a real personal shot at me as writing the script, and uh, I was 24 at the time, and you know it really hurt my feelings. Yeah. It was. I, I thought it was a. You know, reviewers can like a film or not like a film, but when reviewers get personal based on nothing, you know, I mean, I've, it's, uh, I, 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 I since have taken tremendous offense to that when I see it both either to me or to colleagues, you know, say what you want to say about a movie. You can like it, you can hate it, but, you know, don't make, you know, personal comments on the people that make the film who you don't know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah, I thought uh, he he lost all credibility to me as a reviewer after that. Well, you know, at the end of the day, the 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 joke, you know, the last word is is yours, and you know, uh, Mr. Uh, Robert Harmon and and Rugger Hauer and everybody involved in the picture, because look, we're twenty twenty three, dude. About You're it. on the show talking about it. It's the movie that lives on and lives on. And Lance and I were talking about that before. It's passed on from generations to generations to generations. Uh, a lot of Oscar winning movies, for example, will are will be forgotten. They will yes. not be passed on and passed on and passed on and passed on. I saw The Hitcher for the first time on beta. On fucking beta. A lot of people did, yeah. They're, yeah. they're increasingly seeing it back the way we intentionally shot it, you know, in scope yeah. and widescreen and getting an idea. <laughs> The beauty of that look with you know John Seal's cinematography, oh and, yeah, but the whole way. I mean, the great use of natural light in that movie. Mm, uh, yes. I mean, it, you know, I mean, the one thing I'll say, uh, maybe to close, is you know, as everybody knows, when they make a movie, you're focusing on making the movie you're making. You you have no idea. You hope that it'll stand the test of time, but you don't know. You really, you only focus. All you can do is focus on, you know, getting the picture done as well as you can. So. Um, the hitcher has stood the test of time and that's really satisfying, but it's not anything that you can really plan. Some movies do, some movies don't. Um, and that one for you know, probably a number of reasons has, which is, uh, which is tremendous. I mean, it's obviously it's, it's makes me feel really good. Well, as you know, and the hitcher is why I started writing. 
The Hitcher is how you and I met and how we became very good friends and in a, what, 20-year relationship as friends? Longer now, but yeah. Is it longer? Fuck. 2023, buddy. As they say on Bo Québécois. Fuck, man, I'm getting old. Um, so, you know, so for me, like I said, in you know, early in the show to Lance, it will always have a special place in my heart because it, it, is, it was just more than a movie. It literally uh, sent my life in directions. And, you know, I wouldn't be friends with you if I wasn't for the Hitcher and I wouldn't have started uh, writing scripts if it wasn't for the Hitcher. So, arigato. Well, you know, that's one of the nicest parts for me to hear that about making the movie. You know, it's all the other things that not not necessarily we're part of the movie but yeah that it, it means a great deal to me that it means the film means a lot to you and to, to audiences still no well thank you and until we get you next time for the hitcher two <laughs> you keep trying still, you keep, i'll tell you something the day you get me to see the hitcher two you can announce it on the show this will never <laughs> happen ever yeah, but, we'll be, we, it will be in old people's homes i'm still trying <laughs> That's all I have. <laughs> all right. Have a great day, guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. There you have it. Uh, thank you, Eric, for popping by. I really appreciate it. And I'm sure Lance does as well. Oh, of course. Sweetheart. An absolute sweetheart. So, guys, dolls, what about you? What do you think of the Hitcher? Are you a fan? Thumbs up? Thumbs down? Uh, I'm actually curious to know your opinions as to uh, John Ryder's true purpose if you will uh just what what's going on here what, what do you think like what's really going on here so you know spit the comments uh below and uh fuck the remake and fuck the sequel don't do anything i wouldn't do coming soon on dvd and video